So today's presenters then are Laura Schmidt, a professor at the Institute for Health Policy Studies within the School of Medicine at UCSF, Roberto Vargas, who works in community engagement in the health policy program at UCSF, and Leanne Jensen, the wellness director for the organization who had a big role in the organizational changes that they've made in recent months. And then on our side, I think Barry will be leading off commentary um, around what's happening locally in San Francisco within our hospitals, and I will be, uh, and Abby will contribute to that dialogue as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Laura. Hello, and thank you all for the opportunity to share what I know with you about sugar and health. Um, I first want to uh, say, uh, I always put this on my talk, the disclosure statement, which means that uh, my research is not funded. I don't accept any research money from anyone with a vested interest in the debates around food and food policy, whether that would be uh, an industry source or someone who has financial, any financial stake in the issues at hand. It allows me to be a neutral uh, uh, spokesperson for the science. Uh, so, uh, I want to start by um, talking a little bit, sharing with you what is something short of a revolution within the field of uh, nutrition and obesity research around sugar, and some of the key uh, scientific findings that uh, are reshaping the way we think about obesity and metabolic disease and the role of unhealthy diet in uh, those disease outcomes. So the first principle uh, that has really been turned on its head recently, we used to assume that a calorie is a calorie. Uh, intake out, in, how, much, how many calories I take in, if I don't expend all those in energy, I get fat, calorie out, uh, calories in equals calories uh, out. Uh, and people become obese and develop metabolic disease because they're taking in an excess of calories. This is a uh, point of uh, considerable debate now, and the field is increasingly looking to uh, the dietary components uh, in, in, in our food that would uh, lead to uh, obesity and, and unhealthy um, health outcomes related to metabolic disease. A second key point of interest is the growing body of evidence, both epidemiological and clinical, demonstrating the role of heavy sugary beverage consumption, SSB is what we talk about, and there we mean any products that are essentially liquid sugar. Uh, that could be sodas, sports drinks, uh, coffee drinks that have an excess of added sugars in them, and, and these are products with very little nutritional value. And we've been uh, had a, had a uh, tsunami of new research in this area with dietary guidelines being shifted at the World Health Organization as well as in our U.S. dietary guidelines debate. And it's all based on this new body of evidence about sugar's role in metabolic disease. A third real important point of, uh, of uh, in the new area, in the new science on sugar, is emerging research on why sugary beverages might be different from other uh, sources of added sugar in, the, in our diet, and I'll touch on that a little bit. So the new understanding of what we, we tend to call the obesity epidemic, but in fact increasingly we are becoming less concerned about obesity and more with uh, the disease burden of metabolic disease. Um, so. The, the new paradigm in science really comes down to these main points. More and more we're concerned about the quality of diet, not just the quantity of foods people eat. So if you take the difference between omega-rich fatty acids in, say, fish oil or flaxseed oil, and you compare that to the health effects of trans fats, mm -hmm. think about that. Both are fats. Both might even contribute the same calories to the diet. But more and more we're concerned about what is the quality of those nutrients, especially macronutrients like fats and carbohydrates. Secondly, we're learning more and more about how different sources of food and the calories that come from them are metabolized differently within the human body. And a very important body of research is emerging around 
the uh, different kinds of sugars that come in the foods we eat. Uh, there are a variety of them and how our bodies absorb these uh, sugars. And in particular, the, the lot of scientific attention is on a, the sugar fructose, which is what makes fruit sweet. And the fact that fructose is, uniquely, is unique in that it's metabolized almost exclusively by the liver. And as I will point out in a few minutes, rising rates of fatty liver disease seem connected to our excess uh, fr fructose consumption. The other uh, new paradigm, uh, point in the new paradigm is what I mentioned before, a calorie is not a calorie. It's not obesity and, and, and uh, obesity-related diseases are not simply a matter of calories in, calories out. The nature of those calories, the quality of the foods, how our bodies metabolize those calories is, are important in explaining why some people develop obesity and others don't. So in general, more and more scientists in our field are taking our focus not off of obesity, but getting more interested in the metabolic diseases that tend to travel with obesity, diabetes, chronic um, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, mm -hmm. yeah. outcome. Yeah, I put it on. I can hang it up, though? Where's the slide? So, there are two trends in, in population health right now that every, all of us should be not only aware of, but deeply concerned about. These are happening not just in the United States, States but worldwide as a Western diet rich in saturated fats, sugars, and unhealthy dietary components becomes part of the standard fare around the world. Uh, children, in many cases, are, are you know, I, I say they're the canaries in the coal mine. When we start seeing the rise of adult diseases in children, we know that there is something very wrong with our food supply. And one of our greatest concerns is the rise of uh, uh, type 2 di diabetes in children. We call it adult onset diabetes because in my parents' generation, it was never seen in children. Today, one in four American teenagers is pre-diabetic or diabetic. This is a condition that is linked to heavy sugar consumption and especially the consumption of sugary beverages. That's a chilling picture to look at, isn't it? This is what we've seen over the course of a few decades in rising rates of uh, diabetes, and most of the burden is uh, type 2 diabetes. As a population health scientist, I can tell you we don't see these kinds of, of changes in, in, in population health without there being something very wrong in the environment. And added sugars, and particularly in the form of sugary drinks, are one of the main culprits that we're, we're looking at. A second, a second uh, trend uh, that is deeply disturbing in, in the U.S. population, and again, this is happening worldwide as well, it's a prevalent problem in India, is the rise of whole new diseases that, we didn't, even, that didn't even exist before. So the diagnosis non-alcoholic fatty liver disease didn't even exist until 1980. This is, again, a condition linked to heavy sugar consumption. Uh, today, 31% of adults and 13% of our children in America have fatty liver disease. By 2020, this will be the leading cause of liver transplantation in America, a condition that didn't even exist. 30 years ago. Uh, this is showing you the spectrum of what, what happens to people, uh, and this is, uh, I, I, I it, it, from the standpoint of your liver, the onset of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is identical to what is going on when, when uh, people who drink too much develop cirrhosis of the liver due to alcohol mm -hmm. consumption. So fat accumulates in the liver, uh, eventually if it's left unchecked, that fat starts to form inflammation and scarring in the liver, and if the disease continues, uh, the, person, the person will develop cirrhosis and require a liver, a liver transplant. So 
sometimes I talk about these two trends as signs just like as in the case of global warming. When we see melting icebergs and rising sea levels, we know something's wrong with the environment and we need to act and we need to act soon. These are the, the, the warning signs in population health that we have a global warming of human health going on. So it's important for everyone to understand that the idea of metabolic syndrome because currently scientists are viewing this as the underlying uh, syndrome that drives the onset of most forms of chronic disease, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, even uh, Alzheimer's disease. In fact, today many of our experts at UCSF on, on, on uh, uh, Alzheimer's are talking about it as type 3 diabetes. Hmm. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of three, uh, five risk factors that when we see them together dramatically increase a person's chances of developing chronic diseases the things that kill us. Only one of them has to do with obesity, and it's central obesity, a waist, larger waist circumference than the hips. So where we carry the fat has very important implications for the onset of chronic disease. And this, uh, in fact, there's uh, very good evidence that the fat that accumulates around the waist is linked to fatty liver, and those fat cells send out hormonal signals that tamper with the delicate balance of hormones in the human body. High blood pressure, high sh blood sugar, uh, high, uh, low HDL cholesterol, and high uh, blood lipids are also factors in metabolic syndrome. This is what we worry about. There can, the people can be overweight and obese and not have med -S. People, Most people who are obese do have metabolic syndrome, but it's not everyone. And this is what is driving the diseases that Dignity Health is treating most of the time. This is what we need to be worrying about. And, and these are largely uh, uh, risk factors that are driven by bad, poor diet and lack of physical activity. Added sugars, especially fructose, given its impact on the liver, added salt and healthy fats, and physical activity and other lifestyle factors. So the good news is that taken, if we're careful, we can address these, uh, the rising rates of metabolic disease and obesity through lifestyle change. So the question is, uh, um, how, I think, yeah, um, let, me, let me just go ahead and, and, and talk to you just briefly about because people will ask, well, why, why are you so worried about all, uh, all sugars and not, not just, uh, why, why are you so worried about sugary drinks? And why single them out and not worry about desserts and other sources of added sugar? And here are the real reasons. First of all, these are products that tend to have no nutritional value whatsoever and sometimes harmful um, uh, added components, chemicals and, and, and uh, dyes that we, we really shouldn't be consuming in large quantity. They're also the low-hanging fruit of public health. They're the largest single source of added sugars in the diet. There's growing evidence that they are not as satiating as solid foods, so they do lead to excess calorie consumption, and also evidence that they are digested and metabolized very quickly, therefore putting a very large dose of fructose in, into the liver at a, uh, that, that taxes its ability, and wind, that's why we wind up getting fatty liver as well as the pancreas, which is implicated in diabetes. Now, just to briefly point out that our diet has been changing over time. A lot of people say, well, why, why, if we've all listened to the health experts and lowered our fat consumption, are we still getting heavier as a population? And the answer is because we have uh, replaced many of those excess fats in the diet with uh, sugary drinks in particular. And as I pointed out, these, these products have a direct connection to uh, and indirect connection to chronic disease onset. The consumption of soft drinks uh, has been going down more recently, in large part because of all of the public health efforts. And uh, next slide. Uh, but 
some of this has been replaced by the con uh, excess consumption of sports drinks and increasingly sweetened coffee drinks. This is a fact that I think is really important for people to, to key in on. Drinking one soda a day, which is, uh, for a man, basically uh, meets your, uh, the limit that we would recommend that a man would consume uh, in sugar, added sugar per day. Just one soda a day can in increase your risk of dying from heart disease by almost a third. Okay, very quickly, what's, what are the causes of this, of this problem? Over and over again, people will say, just educate the public in healthy choices. It's all about choice. It's an individual's choice what they eat. But we know that that doesn't work. If it worked, then why would 48% of Americans still be drinking a sugary drink a day? The reality is that I could say until I'm blue in the face, don't drink that stuff. You already know it's unhealthy. But when you live in a saturated environment where it's everywhere, always within reach, that makes it very difficult to say no. The concept of saturated environments actually comes out of the alcohol and drug literature, and we know that people in communities where there are a lot of liquor stores and drug dealers, our own tenderloin, suffer from higher rates of addiction. And the explanation is that it's everywhere. You have to work around the drugs in these communities. It's the same with sugar in our environment. It's in everything, it's everywhere, and it's very hard for us to not consume it. So what can we do? We know from a very large body of evidence at this point that diets and exercise alone won't work. They work for some people, but it's often a temporary fix, and it doesn't deal with the underlying metabolic disease, diseases caused by poor diet. Our food supply is saturated by sugar, salt, fats, and processed foods. That's just the way it is. And in order to fix this problem, we need to change the food environment. So this leads to the iron law of public health. A simple equation for solving big problems. It works for tobacco, it works for alcohol, and it will also work for, for di harmful dietary components. If you take, reduce the availability, the saturation of a harmful substance in the environment, you will reduce consumption of it, and that will reduce the harm to health. It's a simple equation. And it all goes back to reducing the availability of the harmful substance. So it, all of our best public me health measures follow the iron law. They, they are all targeted at reducing the availability of harmful products in our environment, making it harder to reach, harder to get, gently nudging consumers away from the unhealthy stuff and making the healthy stuff more available to us. So once you understand this very simple principle, it becomes very easy to come up with a whole spectrum of ways that we can nudge ourselves away from the unhealthy stuff and re-rig the environment to make it safe. One of the most important ways we can do this is in our workplaces. We spend many hours in our workplaces, and this is also true of our homes. The environments that we live in on a daily basis, we can re-rig them to make them safe not for just ourselves, but for our children and our families. And one of the most effective ways to do that is by taking the sugary drinks out of the workplace, taking them out of the schools, taking them out of our uh, uh, environment. The question that I ask myself is if my institution, UCSF Medical, uh, the medical center, is about promoting health and treating chronic disease, why would we be saturating our environment with products that we know cause chronic disease? Very important question to ask ourselves as healthcare providers. Is that consistent with our vision and our mission in the world? Many other ways that we can approach this, changing product placement. When companies put candy at eye level for a child, we can put it up higher on the shelf. It's a very simple thing, making it harder to get the unhealthy stuff and putting the healthy stuff well within our reach. Banning ads, we're part of environmental saturation, is that we're constantly being barraged by carefully uh, designed marketing campaigns designed to, to uh, promote products that are not good for us, and especially sugary drinks. We, the school lunch program has 
removed sodas and sports drinks from schools that want to get federal funding, that doesn't mean that kids aren't getting them from the vicinities around the schools. So again, cleaning up the health environment, making these products harder for our children to get to. Stairs closer to the elevator, I mean, this just, the list can go on and on. The more that you can change the environment to uh, make it let, reduce availability, the more likely we are to bring this obesity and chronic disease epidemics under control. So to sum up, we talk about an obesity epidemic, but what we really need to worry about, especially as healthcare providers, people responsible for, for improving the health of our population. So we need to be thinking about metabolic disease. And sugar, especially in the form of concentrated doses in sugary drinks, is a driver in nearly all of the five factors in metabolic disease, the met metabolic syndrome. We know it's linked to cholesterol, triglycerides in the, in the blood. It's linked to central obesity via the liver connection. It has a role to play in almost all of the five components of metabolic syndrome. If we can tackle metabolic syndrome, we can dramatically reduce the burden of chronic disease. It is a public health crisis. It is the global warming of, of public health. And our healthcare sector is the first place where we need, to, we need to show leadership in this. We can't sit by and watch our children suffer from diseases of adulthood. Sugar is a key dietary component in processed foods and beverages, and it's implicated in all aspects of metabolic disease. And the needed solutions are not, it's, diet and exercise is not gonna work on its own. Educating the public, we've been doing it, and we have a huge body of evidence to show it's not effective on its own. We have, to, we, we have to desaturate the environment, and that means reducing the availability of these products to, for ourselves, for our children, our families, our patients, and our employees. And I really do believe that the health sector is the place that can take the lead on this. We're, it's, it's our mission. It's our, our responsibility. It's in the Hippocratic Oath. Do no harm. If we're produce, if we're if, if our the, the environments in our hospitals and clinics are saturated with unhealthy products, we are part of the problem and not part of the solution. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Laura. Now we're going to turn our attention to a little bit about how some of this uh, science perspective is being translated into action in San Francisco, um, pretty broadly. And so next up is Roberta Vargas, who we've introduced before. And Thank you, Michael. So what I'm going to talk about is how we leverage the science and resources of UCSF uh, to work collaboratively with, uh, with our partners here in San Francisco uh, to change the environment, to raise the level of awareness, um, increase education in the population, and um, and to change uh, policy when appropriate and necessary. And, and I, I want to say that, you know, these are this is the path that San Francisco chose, and of course everyone's got to determine uh, where the opportunities exist in your own in your own locales and uh, who are your champions and what what is the most appropriate path forward. So um, I'm going to talk about some of how we work collaboratively uh, on those different uh, on those different approaches. So as I said, we worked on education. Um, we've worked on both municipal policy as well as organizational wellness policies, um, and we've got some exciting. Uh, activities active now and, and next steps that, uh, that I think are also fairly exciting that I'll share with you all. Next. So we've embraced the socio-ecological model uh, for our approach. Um, as you can see down there at the, at the bottom, by way of strengthening individual knowledge and skills um, and some of the examples that uh, that we include by way of efforts through Shape Up are like tabling at uh, community events. Um, we've got some web-based education. TheBiggerPicture.org is one of those examples. Uh, certainly, some clinical uh, education, patient provider, uh, promoting community education, both by way of community-based workshops 
and outreach as well as our web-based education efforts um, and certainly by way of fostering coalitions and networks and the San Francisco Hospital Council um, has been a key partner in that, particularly in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, so Shape Up San Francisco is a coalition that was uh, formed about eight years ago by um, uh, previous mayor, Gavin Newsom, and uh, they brought together the, the Park and Rec Department, the school district, uh, universities, uh, and other key local partners. San Francisco Health Improvement Partnerships, that SF HIP there, uh, oh, if you could step, just take one step back, SF HIP, um, it, it was an effort that began uh, about six years ago, mostly in partnership between the Department of Public Health and UCSF to find better ways of, of coordinating our local efforts to reduce uh, and eliminate health disparities. And in the last several years, um, the hospital council is now a key leader in that as well. So there's sort of that triumvirate between those three large institutions. Um, and then also, as I've mentioned, the organizational wellness policies and sort of at the, at the outer level, the policy and environmental level, um, UCSF has leveraged our scientists to provide uh, advising on the research um, to local policymakers interested in, in looking at opportunities to develop health policy that is, that's informed by the research and the science. Next, please. So SF HIP uh, has a website, sfhip.org. If you all are interested, we've got local data there, and we share uh, more information about some of our key priorities. Uh, reducing uh, uh, obesity-related disease disparities is one of our key priorities over the last several years as are uh, reducing um, uh, disparities in children's oral, um, oral health. Um, so um, uh, childhood dental caries is, is one of um, the few diseases, uh, chronic diseases that is actually preventable, absolutely preventable, and that's one of our key priorities, as are uh, um, looking at the local alcohol retail and its uh, consumption and uh, impacts on health and safety of, of local communities. Next. So the Shape Up San Francisco Coalition also has a website I invite you to take a look at. And the priorities for that coalition are to uh, increase um, healthy eating, increase physical activity, and reduce consumption of sugary drinks, among other things. Next. So multi-stakeholder effort, uh, all of these. And um, the Hospital Council um, has partnered with us, certainly, and others include the SF uh, policymakers, the university, uh, the Department of Public Health, mayor's office, school district, et cetera. More recently, the business sector has been engaged as a partner, as has philanthropy, uh, and we're certainly partnering with community-based organizations, particularly from those communities that are disproportionately burdened by these health disparities that are priorities for us to address. Next. So some of, some of the ways that these different stakeholders are holding their stakes, so the impacted communities, for example, have co-convened focus groups um, in those impacted communities to help us understand uh, which approaches they think are most relevant uh, and effective from the perspectives of their communities. Um, they've partnered with us to adopt beverage policies, uh, for example, at the San Francisco YMCA, They've got 10,000 families that, that are engaged with their services, and they've adopted policies to be uh, sugary drinks free, for example. And there are other uh, organizations listed there. They've helped us to convene uh, their own education um, resources. So we've got lay health workers and promotoras partnering with us uh, to do that education in community. Uh, and then we've got the bigger picture um, and other organizations working with us for a web-based web education. Thank you. Um, universities, um, particularly UCSF, has helped to leverage the science. Um, UC Hastings leveraged a law uh, for uh, requests from local policymakers as they develop local health policy. We've leveraged our research expertise, um, provided expert testimony when requested by local policymakers, and then we've partnered, as I mentioned, with local communities to learn what um, what approaches they wanted to uh, they wanted to support and see happen in their in their communities. 
We've done evaluation of these efforts, including with UC Berkeley to evaluate our public uh, media campaigns. And then we leverage our, our, our learners uh, to be engaged in all these projects uh, when possible. And then, of course, with sugarscience.org, um, as, as Dr. Schmidt has, has been a key leader in that, um, it, it provides an opportunity to develop an authoritative um, a source of education materials, and I invite you all to check that out at sugarscience.org. Next. So public health, uh, the local public health department certainly has taken a lead, but we've partnered also with the uh, Alameda County Public Health Department, Sonoma, um, and also with American Heart Association um, and others to develop and promote uh, public education. And we've also um, provided technical assistance uh, and have convened uh, coalitions toward these uh, education efforts. Next. Policymakers, as I mentioned, have helped to develop policy, but in addition to that, they, help, they have helped allocate funds for new tap water stations, which is also a part of this effort that's just beginning to launch. Um, and they can call for hearings on what the economic impact of sugary drinks is so that folks in your own local community get a better sense ex of exactly what the impact of um, these products are on the, uh, on the local economy. Uh, and they serve, they've served as uh, spokespeople and have convened hearings. And one of the hearings I'll, I'll point out, for example, is a hearing on uh, what our current water promotion efforts have been here in San Francisco, and that helped us to identify that we could do better in those communities that are most impacted by consumption of sugary drinks. Uh, local ballot measures have, have been crafted by policymakers because they felt it appropriate to help reduce consumption and to develop revenue uh, that could help pay for education, uh, community gardens, uh, and nutritional efforts in schools, increased time and uh, capital improvements in parks, et cetera. And then San Francisco tried its own, and so has Berkeley. Next. Uh, San Francisco actually, although it didn't get the two-thirds it needed to pass, got 56% of the vote, and frankly that uh, bought some political capital with many of the policymakers to move some of the other policies mm -hmm. that eventually did pass. Berkeley soda tax did pass. Next. And recently in San Francisco, so in June, we, pe we did pass three city policies, and I'll talk more about that in a second. UC San Francisco passed its uh, policy that Leanne will cover extensively. And then the Mark Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital um, has adopted a policy to remove all sugary drinks uh, from sale or service on its campuses as well. Next. So those three policies San Francisco adopted were a ban on the use of city funds for sugary drinks purchase ban on city property use for SSB ads. Uh, the city attorney has recommended that that be dropped. The, there's an estimation it won't hold up in court. And then uh, warning labels on ads in San Francisco passed as well, uh, but that'll be uh, tried in the courts because the uh, American Beverage Association is suing the city on that uh, particular ordinance. Next. So ongoing, we're providing that technical assistance I mentioned. We're partnering with the Bay Area Nutritional Physical Activity Coalition to provide technical assistance. The American Heart Association is providing technical assistance around how to do that. And we're also uh, working to evaluate regionally what our efforts are and develop uh, agreed upon and centralized measures. Next. And some exciting next steps are that we're partnering to make sure that there's an equitable distribution of, of um, bottle filling tap stations citywide. Um, we just inaugurated the first yesterday out on 3rd and Clement, very exciting. And we expect to uh, install between one and two dozen over the next 12 months. Um, and we're also partnering with lay health workers from those same community-based organizations to help us shift community norms. We know from the research that uh, folks who are immigrants or descendants of immigrants uh, are less trusting of public water uh, sources because they come from countries uh, where you cannot trust the safety of public water systems. And we also know that low-income folks are less trusting um, given uh, the fact that they're residing in, in uh, older housing stock and sending their children off to schools um, where um, there, there are less new facilities, and so they're less trusting that the, that the plumbing is safe. Um, but we're working with lay health workers to help communicate the fact that we have actually um, 
uh, tremendously safe and delicious public drinking water here in San Francisco, uh, and we hope to shift that community norm through those efforts. Uh, next. So we're partnering, and here's an example. Just last week, we had this session of uh, community-based lay health workers from three uh, community coalitions representing African American, Asian Pacific Islander, and Latino communities to help us uh, translate ed, ed materials into ways that are relevant and communicated in ways that are relevant to those communities that are uh, particularly burdened here in San Francisco by chronic disease disparities. Uh, and I invite you all to contact us if you're interested in um, uh, getting some uh, guidance or assistance around how you might engage local stakeholders uh, to develop partnerships to support the work that you would like to do at your own sites or within your own institutions, uh, please reach out to us and, and we can do what we can. Great. Thank you very much, Roberto. And now we're going to take it over to Leanne Jensen who will tell a story that's a little more specific to what UCSF has done as an organization. Yes, thank you very much, Michael, and I'm glad to be here. And, um, you know, UCSF's mission is advancing health worldwide, and we try to do that in everyday uh, work and in everything that we do. And in reflecting on this presentation today, I was thinking about Dignity's mission, and we're actually very similar. You know, we have a mission of health and changing lifestyles and improving lifestyles, and we're in the business of healthcare. So I just want you all to think about that as we move forward on this presentation today. So as my role as wellness director at UCSF, I'm charged with building a culture of wellness at UCSF. And what does that look like, right? We have 30,000 employees, a couple thousand students, thousands of visitors that visit our campus every day. So we started to deploy the traditional wellness efforts that you see all across the nation. You know, we have healthy eating awareness campaigns, flyers that say make the right choice. We have cooking classes, stretching sessions, on-site yoga. And what we were seeing is we just were not having an impact. For years, we tried this, and man, we were trying it really hard. We were doing all we could. And the one thing that we noticed is that we hadn't addressed our built environment. And the built environment is what you see and experience, regardless if you can attend a class or not. If you were to step foot onto an environment at UCSF, the building, or anywhere for that matter, what are you experiencing? Is it healthy or is it not? And that's how the UCSF Healthy Beverage Initiative was born. At the University of California, San Francisco, advancing health worldwide is our mission. As a renowned health organization, it is important that we are attentive to our health at home. A main factor that prevents many from living healthy lives is excessive sugar intake. It is recommended that men, women, and children limit sugar consumption to live a healthy life. A 20-ounce bottle of soda contains around 16 teaspoons of sugar, which far exceeds everyone's daily limit. Sugar scientists have discovered that sugar-sweetened beverages are a main culprit of the problem. This is any beverage that includes anechoic sweeteners such as soda, energy drinks, fruit drinks, sports drinks, and sweet coffees and tea. With over 60 names, added sugar can be high in anywhere. That's why it's easy to consume more than our daily allowance. Too much sugar doesn't just make us fat. It can also make us sick by overloading critical organs, increasing the risk of diabetes, heart disease, and liver disease, even in people of normal weight. Sugar sweetened beverages are the leading source of added sugar in the U.S. and make up 36% of our added sugar consumption. The average American can save 45 gallons of sugar sweetened beverages a year. We want to do our part to help our faculty, staff, students, patients, visitors, and members of our community to be healthy. As of November 2015, we will only be selling healthy beverages on campus. However, anyone can still bring their own sugar sweetened beverages. We believe a healthy environment helps produce healthy decisions. That's why we continue to develop programs like Smart Choice help identify healthy food options. As a global leader in research about the effects of sugar overconsumption, we are glad to join an ever-growing community of progressive health systems. For more details about our Healthy Beverage Initiative, visit healthybeverages.ucsf.edu. Literally, 
living a house in a life. Now that is me. So hopefully you sort of got the gist of what the Healthy Beverage Initiative at UCSF is and why we did it. And I do want to go over a little bit more detail about it so that you have a full understanding. Uh, we eliminated the sale and service of all sugar-sweetened beverages at UCSF. So this was a phased-out approach. We did this over a 16-week time span. We did just rip everything off the shelves in one day. And over that time span, we spent a lot of time educating our consumers and our employees and everyone about what was going to be happening. Um, so they had a lot of time to digest it and also help us. <clears throat> and this includes all of our vending machines, all of our cafeterias and our hospitals, uh, campus eateries, retail locations, and even all of our catering services and um, our patient menus as well. So people often ask, why sugar sweet beverages? Why are you picking on sugary drinks? You can do a lot with a built environment. You could start anywhere. But I think, you know, what we heard from Dr. Schmidt is that it's the low-hanging fruit. It's the obvious choice. Because of the compelling research that's out there on sugar, and particularly liquid sugar, we know that we can't be in the business of selling sugar-sweetened drinks or providing sugar-sweetened drinks when we know they're the leading culprit to our healthcare crises in America, diabetes, heart disease, and liver disease, to name a few. So here's a list of all of the drinks that are acceptable under our Healthy Beverage Initiative. So the ones in the blue are the ones we sort of promote and say, these are healthy for you. The ones in orange, they're sort of controversial, right? The 100% juice and the diet drinks. They were heavily vetted with our um, research experts, and the reason we ultimately decided to keep them is that the evidence is, isn't as strong on them as, the, as it is with the sugar, the straight sugar drinks. Um, so they are staying for now until that research catches up. And one very important point I want to um, note here is that this is not a ban. Anyone is welcome to bring or drink a sugar sweetened beverage on our property. We just um, also have the choice to not sell it at UCSF. So it's more of a business decision for us and not a personal decision. Here's a list of all of our campus vendors that are voluntarily participating in this Healthy Beverage Initiative. So this is an addition to our hospital cafeterias and our catering services. And um, I think it's really important to note that this, they were all voluntarily participating. That was something our senior leadership really felt strongly about. They didn't want this to be a mandate or feel draconian at all. So we spent a lot of time educating all of these folks. And you can see here there's a lot of chain restaurants like Panda Express and Subway and Jamba Juice that might make you think, what? How did you get them to join? But, you know, we really make them feel every day that there are partners in health. And they believe that, which is the truth. They are. They're on our campus. They're servicing our patients, our faculty, staff, just like we are. And so because of that, they felt strongly enough that this was very important to do. And so since we rolled out the Healthy Beverage Initiative, we've been getting a lot of questions about how did you do it. So I wanted to leave you all today with a few best practices, if you will. So first, it was really important that we modeled ours after another successful organization. We looked at University of Michigan as a best practice. They launched theirs in 2013, and they helped us create a very clear, detailed definition of what a sugar-sweetened beverage is. And it also spoke volumes to um, our leadership and to others that we're following someone else who has had success with this. And we got buy-in from our senior leadership very early. Um, and guidance from them. And you know what was really great is that we rolled out a tobacco policy a few years prior, and it didn't go quite as well because leadership said, yes, let's do this, move forward, you know, didn't really take notice of anyone else's opinion. But in this, they were more thoughtful and said, let's involve everyone from the very beginning. So I thought that was a um, very important note and something that really uh, helped us along the way. And, oh, please stay back. Sorry. Oh, sorry. And we addressed um, and understood potential early revenue changes from the very start. So we learned from Michigan uh, when we first thought of this as an idea, have you seen revenue changes? And they were only a year and a half into their um, initiative. And at the time, they said, yes, our first year, we did see a, about a 30% decrease in, in sales revenue. But the good news is we're already past the first quarter of our second year, and we're already making a 20% return on that. So they, you know, the, what you can assume from that and what they're seeing from that is that um, people will adjust. People need to drink something. <laughs> people are thirsty. They have to stay hydrated. So it may be an initial shock, but ultimately, um, 
even with that senior leadership felt that we can't be in the business of making money off something that we know causes harm. And we were also very clear about the why, and as Dr. Schmidt um, pointed out, there's a mountain of evidence, and we have a mission of health. So that was really our story, and we stuck with it. And we educated and communicated this a lot. I mean, people didn't just hear it once through an email from the chancellor. They heard it from us in presentations in person. We visited people individually if they wanted to talk about it. We had discussions. There were committees. It was, uh, we talked about it a lot. We wanted to make sure people were well informed. And we had a set timeline and stuck to it, and I think people appreciated that. And the number one, probably most important thing is that we addressed freedom of choice before anyone else could ever raise the question. And we said, you know, you're welcome to bring or drink at any time. And lastly, I just want to leave you with some uh, marketing materials. As you'll see here, they have a positive spin. The messaging is talking about what we're keeping instead of what we're taking away. And we want it to be really inclusive with that marketing. Thank you very much, Leanne. You know, one thing, if I could ask Leanne from UCSF, to what degree you worked with HR and or employee wellness, because it's had a huge impact on employees in addition to patients and visitors, mm -hmm. clearly. Yeah, I can kind of tell you just from my experience how it went, like the order. So my colleague and I had this idea, well, and Laura Schmidt and I, three years before it became a reality. And so we had started with our wellness committee. I think we went about it wrong. You know, we started three years ago, went right to our wellness committee and said, what do you think of this idea? <laughs> you know, and not many people had done it at that point, and even these wellness people said, no, that's insane. You know, so then we started to explore it a little bit more, and other people started to do it, and so we decided to take a different approach a couple of years later, and we went straight to senior leadership, which is our um, chief HR officer, our chief medical officer, and our associate medical officer, and we pitched the idea, and then that's when they said, we like it, let's go find out what everyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. So then we had to go to our stakeholders, which then we went back to the wellness committee and said, we have senior leadership buy-in, now what do you think? Here are some other people, and that's when um, we got them involved. There's, you know, I think it's vital to get them involved, but um, that's just how it played out for us. I think it could play out anyway for any organization. No organization is the same, you know, so mm -hmm. I think that's important. This is Laura from UCSF. I wanted to add that one of the most important things I think that shifted the di discussion, reframed the discussion for us at UCSF as a public university was to take the focus, you will hear over and over again by everyone you talk to, it's why do you want to take away my personal choice? And you have to just flip the script on that one. And you say, this is not about personal, your personal choice. You have complete freedom of personal choice in what you want to drink and eat. This is about our, public, our, our institutional responsibility. We're a public institution. We have produced and generated a lot of the research documenting the harmful effects of sugary drinks, and it's just not right. It's just not okay for us to be doing this.